Why prairies? Why would you want to plant, as my neighbors called them 34 years ago when I went into business, weeds? <laughs> prairie nursery was the weed farm to the local farmers. Kind of tongue in cheek, but kind of not. Until one day I invited Howard over, who was always calling us the weed farmers. And Howard, I want to, I'm going to walk the fields with you. You come over to my nursery, we'll walk the fields. And if you find one plant in my nursery that I'm growing that's a weed in your fields, I will eat it. Right in front of you. And we walked the fields for a couple hours, and he says, I've never seen plants like this. These are really cool. And none of them are weeds in my fields. Thank God I didn't have to eat any of this stuff. So, <laughs> there are only a few that could hurt you anyway. So, But interestingly, when I started doing this, I actually started working with prairies in 1978, a couple years after Greg did. And I did it because it was a project. I, I selected a project for my plant physiology class at UW-Green Bay where I went to school. And you know, you go to the library, read six articles, and write a couple pages and turn it in, right? Oh, no, I had to go out and sample the vegetation and lay out the whole prairie that had been recently planted uh, on the Arboretum. I was on the Arboretum Committee when we developed the Arboretum. It was a brand new university. And I was hooked. And that was the beginning of it. And when I started to learn about the prairies as I researched them, the plant community is so fascinating. And this is really the foundation of what we do when we landscape with native prairie plants, or with any native plants, but we're going to focus on prairies today. The concept of creating a plant community in your garden or your meadow, depending on the size, whether you're putting in transplants in a small area to create a garden, or using seeds to create a larger prairie meadow on a larger area, the concept remains the same. And that is the concept of a plant community. Now, a prairie is a grassland ecosystem. It is dominated by grasses. However, there is flexibility within the model. And for years, people would say, all prairies are 80% grasses, 20% forbs, and that's all should be ever for after. Uh, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I've been in enough prairies to know this gospel ain't right. Because there are some prairies that are heavy on flowers, some prairies that are heavier on grasses in nature, in these remnants. So, we can, as long as we adhere to the general rules of creating the plant community and putting all the players in there, or enough players into our garden or our meadow, we can recreate that plant community and get the desired result. Some people want more flowers. Some people want more grasses. Some people want a nice blend of the two. The trick to this is, and we're going to see some examples of this, and there's actually some information in our catalog too, but our website has a ton of information. You can only print so much. It gets kind of pricey to print a catalog that thick with all the information. So thank God for websites. And you can just go to prairienursery.com, and there's tons of information on there. And if you go to uh, Neil's page, which is under Prairie Nursery, and then you go down, you'll see Neil. There's all the articles that I've ever written since I was four years old. No. <laughs> No poems. I'll put those on later. <laughs> so the concept here, and this is, this is the basic foundation of what we do when we create a prairie landscape, is that we have to have grasses in that plant community. Because what kind of root systems do grasses have? Dense, thick, fibrous roots. Some shallow, some deep. Some prairie grasses only root a foot deep. Some prairie grasses go eight feet deep. So it's all over, the, all over the page. But it's those dense roots that occupy the soil surface. And when you're looking at creating a low maintenance, sustainable landscape, what are you trying to not have? Weeds. 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 Okay? I am not going to spend a lot of time weeding my landscape. I'm basically lazy. Okay? I'm going to use the plants to make a low maintenance, sustainable landscape. I am going to make the plants do the work for me. So that means I need a certain percentage of grasses. Now, different flowers have different kinds of roots. Some have fibrous roots, not dissimilar from grasses. Some have tap roots. They go 10, 12, 15, 20 feet deep, depending on the soil type. Some have rhizomes. There's all different kinds of roots. And you'll see in our catalog, we actually list the root types so you can understand how the plants interact with one another. But we want to make sure that we associate a sufficient number of grasses with the plants, with the flowers, especially the tap-rooted flowers. Because if I just plant, how many people here have grown butterfly weed? Sclepius tuberosa, all right. What kind of root does it have? 
taproot. Okay? So here's this taproot all the way around that plant. Open soil. What grows in the open soil? Weeds. Weeds. So I've got to put some buddies next to that plant. So I'm going to put some grasses or maybe some more fibrous rooted flowers that are going to occupy that soil environment. So you have to think not just above ground, more importantly is to think, or equally or more importantly, is to think below ground. Does anybody know the average percentage of living plant material, biomass, in prairie plants that is underground? Two thirds. Two thirds. Bing, 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 bing. It can be anywhere from 50 to 85% is in the roots. What you see above the ground is only a fraction of the living plant material. Now why is that? We don't think about it very often, but we live in a pretty brutal climate here in Wisconsin. This is a continental climate. We had a visiting professor from Holland at UW-Green Bay. It was one of those <coughs> really cold winters and tons of snow. I think it was 1979, 1980, if anybody remembers that one. I remember the winter of 34. Oh, boy, that was really tough, but uh, kidding. But he said, this place reminds me of Siberia. <laughs> and back then, it was kind of like Siberia. It was really cold and really, I think we got way more snow than Siberia usually gets. Point being is that plants have to live in extreme conditions. The lowest temperature we recorded at our nursery was 42 below zero without the wind chill. Yes, in February of 1995. And the highest temperature recorded was 108 in a drought of 1988. So here you have this huge 150 degrees Fahrenheit of temperature ranges and drought and cold. Remember the polar vortex a few years ago? We bury all our water lines to our greenhouses eight feet deep. Stupidly, we plowed, it's on, on a driveway by our greenhouses, we plowed it, the water lines froze. The frost went nine feet deep. Shouldn't have plowed it. If we left the snow there, we'd have been fine. Now, those plants are dealing with frost nine feet deep. Now, this is in sandy soil. You won't get this in a nice loamy soil or a clay soil, but in our, in our sandy soil, it doesn't hold a lot of moisture. And so the, the cold can penetrate very deeply. So you have extreme heat, drought, extreme cold, and these are real impediments for a lot of plants. So you have to have really, really tough plants. So by using native plants, you know they're going to be able to handle our climate. But you want to make sure that you associate them properly with regards to the root systems. Yeah. A prairie is not impermeable or invincible, impervious, that's the word I'm looking for, to weeds. Quackgrass. Everybody here has dealt with quackgrass. And quackgrass has that pointy rhizome, and it can go right into the crown of a grass and coexist in there. But we have ways to deal with quackgrass. It's called fire. Okay, and we're going to talk about that. What about creeping charlie? Creeping charlie, we can burn that out. Okay, with, with controlled burning. Mowing doesn't work so well in creeping charlie, so that's where burning is much better than mowing. And so we'll talk about burning versus mowing. There are prairie plants for dry, sandy soils. There are plants for heavy clay soils. There are plants for damp, moist soils. And there are prairie plants for regular, good, well-drained, loamy and salt loamy soils. And you'll notice in our catalog that the plants are arranged by the soil type. Of course, some plants care, don't just live in one environment. They cross over into other environments. I, I had a customer who had terrible problems with tomato hornworms in his food garden, in his vegetable garden. And he planted one of our quarter pound prairie mixes for 1,000 square feet that just happened to have a plant called rattlesnake master in it. Rattlesnake master is primarily pollinated by wasps. And as soon as that plant started flowering, his problem with tomato hornworms went away. Gee, I wonder why. Because there is a parasitic wasp that the female has this very needle-like thing called an ovipositor on the stern end of the body that puts eggs inside the larva of the tomato hornworm. And this is a very common strategy by many parasitic wasps. The eggs hatch inside the larva and eat it from the inside out and then burst out. You don't think that movie Alien was just somebody's creation, right? <laughs> Mother Nature is an amazing source of inspiration. So when you're looking at the whole concept of biodiversity, so many of these prairie plants support so many important pollinators, parasites, etc., that help us. So, now how do these plants suddenly, amazingly, transcend from weeds to something you would want to plant? Well, this happened right around 1987, 1988. This beautiful plant called purple coneflower. 
Who doesn't like purple coneflower? I want to see you raise your hand. Okay. Miraculously, purple coneflower about that time was elevated from the status of wildflower to perennial. <laughs> perennial. Now, I can put it in my garden because it's a perennial. And I consider purple coneflower the Jackie Robinson of the prairie plants because it broke the weed barrier. <laughs> Opened the garden gate for all the other plants to come in and be appreciated. So it's, it's an amazing story that this one plant opened people's eyes to native prairie plants. And it's just been growing and growing ever since. And it's never grew fast. When I first started, I couldn't give this stuff away. I couldn't give it away. Nobody wanted it. Who wants to plant weeds? But I knew, I knew someday this was the future. And why is it the future? What I call the four E's. Aesthetics, if you'll accept Webster's second spelling of aesthetics with E rather than A-E. You can't have three E's and one A-E, right? You got some beautiful plants here. You got beautiful flowers and beautiful grasses, even a few shrubs that live in the prairie, low-growing shrubs. You've got ecology, the environment. I can create sustainable landscapes. Throw away all your insecticides. Throw them away. You'll never need them again. You don't want them because you're going to kill the good guys. Very rarely will you ever have to fertilize. And herbicides, you may need to use herbicides to get started to kill the weeds off. And you may, if you have real problems, there may be a, a few perennial weeds that you might have to use herbicides on locally to control. But once your prairie is up and running, you should not need to use hardly any, if any, pesticides or fertilizers. Very environmentally sound. Those thick roots encourage infiltration of <coughs> rainfall, reducing runoff and flooding and increasing water levels in the water table. And of course, you're creating habitat. So you have a wide variety, those are just the top three, wide variety of reasons why this is an ecologically, environmentally sound landscape. The third E, which we often don't think of, is energy. How much energy goes into, let's, let's beat up on the lawn, huh? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so much fun to beat up on the lawn. <laughs> Easy target. Okay. How much energy goes into a lawn? So much. A lot. And you think, oh, well, yeah, the fuel for the lawnmower. Yeah, but you had to make that lawnmower made out of steel, plastic, et cetera. How much energy did that take? You had to transport the lawnmower to the, to the site where it's sold. Then you have all the fertilizers. Where do fertilizers come from? Phosphorus is mined and transported either from Florida or Chile. Nitrogen is made by the Haber process, which uses huge amounts of natural gas. Pesticides come from, and herbicides come from what basic product? Oil, Oil petrochemicals. So you have a quite significant carbon footprint in a typical lawn. The fourth E is economics. I can save you a lot of money. You're not gonna have to spend all this money on all this junk and temp chemicals and equipment. Really, once your prairie is established, all you need is some fire. Or more, you might have to mow once a year. But you're not gonna have all these inputs and it's gonna save you money. And I can talk to corporate CEOs about how all the first three E's, how beautiful it is and how environmentally sound it is and how much energy you're gonna save. When I get to the fourth E and say, I can save you money, they're like, ooh, okay, what do we gotta do? Now that makes sense, that goes to my bottom line. That goes to your bottom line if you're a company, it goes to your bottom line if you're a homeowner. And the fifth E, which we often overlook, is the emotional attachment to the sense of place. I have customers who say, planting my prairie was the best thing I ever did, sort of, except for marrying my husband or wife. Okay. And sometimes the prairie actually goes ahead of the husband or wife. But. <laughs> so there's this sense of connection and the sense of wonder that you see, because when you plant these native plants, you don't just get the flowers and the grasses, you get all the visitors that come to it. You get the bees, you get the birds, everything that comes with it.